So I'm glad to see you all. <coughs> it's my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Robert Thomas, and he's a familiar face to most of you. Has been a member of People's Church, I found out this morning, since 1969. And he and his wife, Dottie, uh, you live in Oklahoma now, right? Mm -hmm. Have raised two sons, and they are great travelers, and they are from Pennsylvania. His degrees are from Penn State. Uh, he's got a bachelor's in social science, a uh, master's in geography and geology, and his PhD in geography. So he retired from Michigan State in 1992, but he still maintains an office there and goes every day to work. And that's his joy. His son Scott is back there. His son Scott is back there, and he's plucking some kind of a hello <laughs> camera at <laughs> me. <laughs> so nice to have you join us today. So help me in welcoming Dr. Rob Thompson. I'm going to sit here on the stool, and I hope you all can see me. I'll be up and down a little bit. But uh, the, as, as Mary Ann mentioned, I retired from MSU in 92. But from 92 to about 2000, I did the cruise ship lectures, where we hit most of the islands in the Caribbean and quite a few of the ports in South America. Also, during that time, I took students overseas for international studies at, uh, at MSU. Uh, we were in Carretero, Mexico, Manita, Dominican Republic, and then three years, believe it or not, in Cuba during the administration of McPherson, who wasn't exactly a leftist, as you all know. Uh, but he, we, we, uh, we convinced him, and in fact, his idea of going to Cuba was it might be nice for the Cuban people to see our kids and what our <coughs> school or what our university, how it runs, versus the controls that Fidel has over them. Okay? First of all, the prologue talks about these trips that I made to Latin America and the Caribbean from the early 1960s up until the present time. And the, uh, also the prologue mentions that these are all my narratives. They're not taken from books or articles. They're taken from personal experiences by Dorothy and the kids and myself. Usually by myself, but Dorothy and the, and the kids made three trips from Indiana, Pennsylvania, and then MSU by land, by car, into Guatemala, and later on into Honduras. Let's define a few terms. If Dorothy will put up the map of South America, or of the Western Hemisphere, there always are problems between North America, South America, Anglo America, and Latin America. So many times you'll hear the commentators, well-known commentators on many of the, many of the uh, major networks, they talk about Nicaragua and Costa Rica and Guatemala as being in South America, and they're not. The division between North and South America is the isthmus or where Panama meets Colombia. East Southern Panama and Northwestern Colombia. That, that is the division between North and South. And then Latin America, of course, is everything from the Mexican border all the way to the Tierra del Fuego, land of fire, the southern tip of South America. Okay? <clears throat> What's on the screen? Okay. The initial trip to Guatemala. When I was at Penn State in residency, there was a Frank Kohler there, who was a very good friend, who took a job at Northern Colorado University. And when he went to Northern Colorado University, he replaced Bud Minkle, Clarence Minkle, Jeanette's husband, as a planning advisor, two-year assignment in Guatemala City. Well, when I, uh, Frank and I were on Christmas card correspondence, and when I wrote to him in December of, 90, of 83, December of 63, I said, Frank, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do population, population geography, demography, internal migration. I'm going to do it somewhere in Latin America, but I hadn't picked out a, a point or a spot at that time. Well, he wrote back immediately and said, look, I've taken this position of Clarence Minkle here at Northern Colorado, and Bud Minkle is in Guatemala City. 
working for USAID and working for the Guatemalan government. You better contact him. You should contact him. I wrote to Bud. I got back a, believe it or not, five-page, single-spaced, handwritten letter telling me why I should come to Guatemala. <laughs> After correspondence of uh, two or three months, Dorothy and I and the two boys and a beat-up old Rambler station wagon with lots of room in the back for the kids. Didn't have to have seatbelts at that time, of course. And a 13-foot Scotty travel trailer. And in May of 1963, May of 1963, or 64, excuse me, we headed south. I must say something about when we got to the border of Mexico. I have to give a plug to a company there, Sanborn's Odd Mexican Auto Insurance. You must have Mexican auto insurance when you go into Mexico. In most cases, <coughs> your, US, your U.S. insurance does not cover you. Sanborn's provides you with a beautiful trip ticket, much like you get from the three A's, received from the three A's here. And the trip ticket tells you, first of all, the uh, oil companies in Mexico are controlled by Pemex. You don't have a Gulf and a Texaco and Sitco sitting on a street corner on opposite corners. And sometimes those gas stations are far between. So they told you where all the different gas stations were, and they also told you gas stations that you should avoid, where some of their customers have been ripped off. They would also mention side trips you might want to take as you went south. We arrived in Mexico City with few problems, getting over the border, few problems. And we're ready to leave, and on the way out of town, Dorothy said, I would like to go by the Zocalo. And I said, Dorothy, we're not going to go near the Zocalo. Famous last words. Here we had this travel trailer, this rambler, a city of eight million people at that time, and Dorothy is manning the trip ticket, manning the, uh, the, the uh, map. The first thing I look up, and where are we? There's the National Palace, there's the major Catholic church, which is sinking slowly, believe it or not, you step down into it because Mexico City is, uh, is uh, slowly sinking. Well, she got me to the Zocalo, but we became lost, I mean completely lost, until finally we're what we're trying to find is a four-lane highway from Mexico City to Puebla, four-lane highway. And we're working our way out of town and we're lost. We pull off the side of the road and this Mexico City police car pulled up beside us. Handsome looking fellow gets out, spoke perfect English, and said, may I help you? <laughs> Certainly did. And believe it or not, he said, follow me. And he gave us a police escort outside through all this maze of traffic, put us on the highway, and headed us off to Puebla. Now once we got to Puebla, we had to make a decision. We could go one of two ways. We could go off to the east coast to Veracruz and skirt along the Caribbean coast, which would be a lowland route. But I took a look at <coughs> where we were at Puebla and where Oaxaca was, which was about halfway south on the peninsula, drew a straight line, and usually a straight line between you know, origin and destination is the easiest way to go, the, most quick, the quickest way to go. Well, as a geographer, I should have known better. <laughs> I didn't look at, I, uh, and I taught the stuff. That's what bothers me. What we were doing, we were going right down the heart of the mountainous area of southern Mexico. Up and down, up and down, round curve, round this curve. What a, what a mess. Uh, but we, we, finally, we finally made it to about, oh, 50 miles north of Tehuantepec, which is on the southern border, the isthmus of Tehuantepec, when, before you get to Guatemala. And we came across this brand new highway. There was only one problem. The old road was impassable. But here was a highway, it came up to the bridge, and here was the bridge sitting up here, a gap of about 15 to 20 feet. And no way could you get that trailer and the car up on the bridge. And here's where Dorothy, good thinking. We drove off to a nearby town, 
picked up two big planks, about 12 inches wide, so thick, about 15 feet long, strapped them to the top of the Rambler. We also had a spare tire up there. We looked like gopies, of course, coming in there. We drove up to the first bridge. Dorothy and the kids, what they do? They put the planks from the below here up onto the bridge. I drove onto the bridge. They picked up the planks. I drove off the bridge, and away we went. We did that on four different occasions as we went south. Now, we had no problem getting out of Mexico. No, not a problem. But getting into Guatemala was another story. We pulled up to the, the uh, gate, where, which was being manned by uh, Duana people, by people from the customs, of course. And there was a car, one, only one car in front of us. And it was a VW bus had, uh, pulled by a young woman and two teenage daughters. They were going to a wedding in Costa Rica. And they had that thing stuffed. Well, what do inspectors do? They have to inspect. They made them take everything out of that VW bus. They had all these presents wrapped up. They had to unwrap all the presents, lay them out on the concrete. And then, of course, when they were finished, they had to repack the uh, station wagon. Well, it took them about two hours to get out of there until we pulled up to the gate. Well, we arrived there at 10 o'clock. But what time was it when we got up to the gate? Five minutes to 12. And what happens at five minutes to 12 or 12 o'clock? Siesta time. The gate went down. And for two hours, these guys are off eating or drinking or whatever they were doing. Well, at two hours, 12 o'clock or two o'clock in the afternoon, they came back and uh, went through all of our stuff. Here's the absurdity of that, in fact. Dorothy had some canned goods, so we wouldn't have to have, uh, buy fresh vegetables on the route. And this one guy took a can of whole can of corn, took it over to a scale, weighed it, wrote it on his piece of paper, the number, the, the weight of it, and then we put it put it back in the trailer. Well, again, all the stuff is laid out before us, so we had to pack and get out of there about 4 o'clock, I would say. Fine, we're now on our way to Guatemala City. Free open shot. Except, except, we came to a, the Guatemalans were putting in a brand new highway in the northern, the, between the Mexican border and uh, Squintla on the south coast of Guatemala, where we went up into the highlands to Guatemala City. Guatemala City is about 5,000 feet elevation. It's in a highland basin, truly a land of eternal spring. Well, here we were. We came up to this brand new highway, but it was gated, and there were two guards there. And I explained, look, I have to get on this highway. Uh, we're going to Guatemala City. He says, nobody's passing. He said, you have to take the highland route up to Quesaltenango at 10, 11,000 feet, windy road. I said, this ring will never make it. And this is where I don't like to do something, but occasionally you must do. I reached in my wallet, took out a $5 bill. And the follow-up took the $5 bill, and he looked at it, increased it, and he pointed to his buddy. I took out another $5 bill, gave him the two $5 bills, and believe it or not, the gate went up. And we drove on. That happened four different times over the next few miles, and about $80 for about 20 miles, that's the most expensive toll road I've ever taken. We finally then, we were on our way, we came roaring into, it was getting dark then, we came roaring into uh, Guatemala City, and uh, to the home of Bud and Jeanette Minkle. Uh, they gave us a delicious meal, bedded down for the night, and we were ready to go the next day. Now, you have to think of the political situation in Central, well, in fact, in Latin America at that time. Here is Fidel Castro sitting out there in Cuba being supported as a surrogate for the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was dumping $8 billion into the Cuban economy every year, so Castro would export his, his uh, uh, undermining the countries of South America, Latin America, with the communist rhetoric he had. Okay, the day after we arrived in Guatemala City, the United States government had given Guatemala 23 brand new 
four-door black Chevrolets. Why they were black, I have no idea. They came into Puerto Barrios on the Caribbean coast, were driven into a secure guarded area in near the central city. The day after we arrived, some surgeons got into that compound, don't ask me how, and torched every one of those three brand new Chevrolets. Well, what a mess. The next morning, nothing but twisted steel and plastic and you name it. In the meantime, two or three days later, I'm now working with Bud and with a Jose Lopez Toledo in a planning office of the Department of Public Works in Guatemala City. And about six months before, Bud had been instrumental in having a brand new uh, Jeep Wagoneer. Now, I don't know if it's called a Jeep Wagoneer at that time, but a beautiful, you know, one of these carry-all vehicles given to the Office of Geographic Studies. And Bud uh, turned it over to, the, to those folks there. Well, when those 23 Chevrolets got burned up, they came to me and they said, we have to get this Jeep out of here at night, at least till things quiet down. So Thomas, you take it home and park it in your fenced-in lot in uh, outside on the outskirts of the city. Okay, fine. Every morning for the next 30 days or so, I would go out in the morning. I would crawl down and look under the vehicle. I would carefully open up the hood to make sure nothing else had been attached. I would come over, carefully open the door, sit in the seat, put my hands over my face, and hit the ignition. Fortunately, nothing happened. But what we had to do every day, I had to take a different route into the, into the, uh, into the tower because if you took the same route, then they would, the, these insurgents would figure out where you were and they might attack you on the way in. Okay. Excuse me? Oh yeah, welcome to Central America. Uh, we had, as I mentioned, the uh, the problems with the uh, with the insurgents at that time. I think we go on now to the migration study. Okay. The, the problem in, in Latin America is different than the problem here. After World War II, we abandon our major cities. Latin America has been entirely different. People are flooding in there by the tons. Guatemala City was about. 600,000 people at that time, growing at growing at 15 percent per year, which meant in 50, excuse me 5 percent per year. In 15 years, the population was going to double, and at that time they couldn't keep enough schools, they couldn't keep enough housing, sewage disposal. Forget it. They dumped the sewage in one of the nearby big barrancas, big by canyons. In the in the rainy season, fine, fine, it got flushed out. In the dry season, when it doesn't rain, it didn't get flushed out. So you could imagine what that was like. When I began this, so the Guatemala government then uh, hired me as an urban planning advisor to look at the migration system of Guatemala City as a geographer location. Where are the people coming from? How are they getting into the city? What's the impact on where they're coming from? What's the impact on the city? As a result, I administered 2,500 questionnaires to a stratified random population throughout this city, 18 zones. And I was assigned one of their better, uh, better workers in the uh, Office of Geographic Studies, Rodolfo Ibera, to be my uh, administrative assistant. And he, would, he, he was the one who would go up and knock on the door and identify himself as a as a member of the uh, migra of, of the uh, migration system of Guad the Census Bureau of Guatemala, and then once we got <coughs> put in the door, we administered a seven or eight page questionnaire. Well, we were on the street about oh four or five days. Now Adolfo's father was a rich coffee broker. He bought coffee, sold it to major corporations in the United States about three or four days in the sample, his father got a message from the insurgents. We know where Rodolfo is every day. If you don't cough up $25,000, Rodolfo is going to disappear. We were assigned an armed guard by his father. 
and that armed guard followed us every day throughout the city, wherever we were. In fact, the last, uh, after the census was over, after about six weeks, uh, Dorothy had a, uh, a banquet for all the people who helped with the, uh, with the census. And Rodolfo appeared at the banquet. He was toting a gun. Dorothy made him take his gun out of his pocket and put it away because he didn't want a gun going <coughs> off and kids running hard, two boys running around there. But Rodolfo also had his guard who was out in front of the, uh, in front of the house guarding him while, while the party was going on. Now, yes, presidential elections of 1966. Well, when we were first there, the, the government of Guatemala was under a dictator, Colonel Peralta. Colonel Peralta promised that he was going to have free and open elections uh, during, uh, after he thought things had settled down. So in April 1966, the elections were going to be held, free and open. There were three candidates. The Peralta's candidate, though, was called Juan de Dios, Juan of God. Well, we all knew who was supposed to win the election. One of God. One of God. Well, it came up that one of the, that the story was that if one de Dios did not win, there was going to be a coup. No question. Peralta would throw out whoever was elected and continue his administration. When here I am sitting in my office, we now had the cards from the questionnaires punched on the IBM cards two boxes of IBM cards, sitting at my desk. I'm sitting at my desk one, one morning, worrying about what happens if there's a coup, and talk about anxiety. Uh, how do I get these things out of here? And there's my dissertation sitting there in front of me. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there at the desk, and my eyesight went like this, to where I only had two pinholes. I was going blind. And if you don't think that scares you, try it sometime. I put my head down on my desk, closed my door, uh, so the other people with whom I was working wouldn't bother me. Put my head down. I thought, what am I going to do? After about a half an hour, I looked at the pinholes and increased to about 20% vision. Then after about an hour later, 40% vision. And about, uh, I would say, an hour, an hour and a half later, I probably had 50% of my vision back. At least it was improving. Now that day, I had a luncheon engagement with a member of the U.S. Census Bureau who was helping Guatemala with setting up their census. His name was Philip Cook. I had a luncheon appointment with Phyllis Cook at a French restaurant about six blocks away. By that time, my eyes probably were open to about 60 percent. So knowing the area around the office and where the French restaurant was, I was able to make my way over to the French restaurant, meet Phil. Phil had an apartment right there in the central part of the city, and we went over and I stretched out for a while. So by the time I was ready to go home that evening, I probably had, oh, 80 percent of my vision back. Well, when I told Dorothy what had happened that night, she said, you are going for complete physical examination. I don't want a blind husband on my hands in Guatemala City. So we made arrangements with an, with an MD who had a, a beautiful suite. He had all the machines there and all the stuff to, to test me. And for about two hours, you know, they prod here, prod there, and do everything to you. And finally, I went into the office of the, of the doctor, and he's sitting across from me with a very, very stern face. And he said, look, you North Americans come down here. You come down here with these brilliant ideas. You spend six months or a year here, and you make recommendations how we should change our government. Our government, which has been existing here since 1821, <coughs> with all these social, and political, economic problems. Take your dissertation stuff, take your questionnaires, take your information home. Write that thesis. When you have it written, bring it back here and present it to Guatemalan and USAID officials and he says, I don't think you're going to have any more problems with your eyesight. And it's never happened since. It was all a case of stress and strain. I listened at that time. Now, when we were in Guatemala, 
64, 65, and 66, a new ambassador came online in Guatemala City. His name was John Gordon Mead. If you had to choose a, a person to be an ideal ambassador for the United States government was John Gordon Mead. He was tall, slender, forehead of white hair, uh, spoke fluent uh, Spanish, was well liked by the people in the, in the administration as well, and he liked to get out to the countryside and shake hands, and that was one of his problems. We believe he made an uh, agreement with the Johnson administration. By the way, remember I told you kidnapping was going on all these times, okay? All right. What happened uh, uh, with, with, uh, when he came on board? He said, I want to go out and meet with the people. I don't want armed guards standing around me all the time. I simply will not put up with it. But he said, I will not be taken, I will not be kidnapped. Believe me, I won't. Fine. One day, Gordon Mead was driving down on the, one of the main streets in Guatemala City, La Reforma, a beautiful tree-lined street. Car pulls up in front, car pulls up in the back. Who's there? The insurgents. Mean opened the door and to run out to make a quick exit so he wouldn't be kidnapped. He was assassinated right there on the spot, right in the heart of the city. Well, the two, the two cars in front took off right away. Now, there was the chauffeur, though, up front. Now, the chauffeur was also the chauffeur for Eric Mean, the son, the young son, uh, early teenager, of the, uh, by the chauffeur. So the chauffeur took him all to the like to the swimming, to any of the social gatherings, he took him to school. As a result, the chauffeur and the son became very, very close friends. Very close friends. Fine. Let me go back to Bud Minkle then. When Bud Minkle left Guatemala in 1964, he brought back with him, or had brought back with him, his chauffeur from Guatemala, uh, Domingo Picasso, and uh, sponsored Domingo here in Lansing, and got him a job at uh, Motor Wheel. Well, when, that, when the uh, accident, when the assassination happened, they got the chauffeur out of the country immediately. And where did they put him? The, he was the cousin of the driver that Bud had sponsored previously. So Mean's chauffeur came to Lansing, Michigan. Now, that was 19, October 28, 1968, when Mean was assassinated. We now move to the early 90s. Dorothy is a music teacher at Edgewood School. Dorothy was also an art enhancer at Edgewood School. And periodically, she would bring in mothers from the community to show paintings to the kids, go to the classroom, show paintings to the kids, or if they were painters, actually how they painted, or maybe discussing a painter to the kids. She had about six people in the, in the, uh, in the uh, school that day. And after the after this, the uh, teacher, the um, parents had gone, one of the parents walked into Dorothy's class, and she's looking around Dorothy's room, and she noticed that Dorothy had a bunch of instruments, wooden instruments, all kind of instruments, around the room, and she was curious about these instruments, and Dorothy said, "Yes," she said, "a lot of these instruments came from Guatemala." Mm. That's interesting. The mother said, my son, my husband. Oh, excuse me, my husband was actually living in Guatemala. Her husband now, Eric Mean, the one that was the good buddy of the driver, was a, now a, a DO and was taking classes at Michigan State University. <laughs> so here now, you have the Means, Eric Mean, the young son who was with the chauffeur, and, he, and once that happened, we arranged, Dorothy arranged a meeting between Eric Mean and the chauffeur who was now living in, in uh, Lansing, Michigan. Well, you know what an embrazo is, you know, a hug. Women hug here in the United States. Even in, in uh, Latin America, <coughs> men, if they're very, very good friends, they, they hugged also. Well, 
The means came early. We were having the buffet luncheon, and in came the chauffeur. Here's where I have to be careful I don't choke up, because I've seen Imbrazos. I've never seen an Imbrazo like that. They actually, to what they didn't break every bone in their body, to be quite <laughs> frank. Just, tears just flowed out of their eyes. In fact, before it was all over, we were crying. Everybody was crying and weeping because of this crazy incident. <clears throat> when it was all over, Mrs. Mean, the uh, husband of the assassinated ambassador, said, it was a beautiful closure to what otherwise was a very tragic, a very tragic event in the life of the Mead family. Okay, how's our time? It's ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. All right. Volcano climbing. Don't ask me why, but geographers like to climb volcanoes. I just, I don't know why. We just do. And when we were in Guatemala City, I, I was there with an Oscar Horst, who was a uh, professor <laughs> at Western Michigan University. And Oscar Horst had brought with him, we wanted to take some special slides in Guatemala for classroom use or maybe for possible for future uh, research. So he brought along a Terry Bond, who was a was undergraduate student, but he was a professional photographer. And we're in Guatemala City, and we wanted to go, go up to a place called Pacaya. It was a volcano of just over 8,000 feet, about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes outside of Guatemala City. So we drove our car to the base of the mountain and started up the mountain. Now, the first thing we forgot to do was to take a flashlight with us. And this volcano had been erupting for the last 20 years, and there was volcanic ash everywhere. And it was a very narrow path, and it was very difficult to see the path, especially without a flashlight. And we also wanted to arrive there some near dark or near, near dusk, because we, that way, if we got a good fiery plume coming out of the volcano, it would show up better on the slide. Okay, fine, excellent. We worked our way carefully, and there's these big cat. Oh, also with this loose ash all over the place. There were big chasms, maybe 50 feet, 20, uh, 50 feet, 100 feet deep, that you had to be careful you didn't fall into. But we worked our way up to the top of the top of the mountain and started taking pictures. Terry took off around the other side of the mountain because he wanted a different perspective. We get up there and Oscar and I are taking slides, boom, 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 and all of a sudden it's getting dark. And I say, Oscar, we better get out of here pretty soon. By the way. Uh, the, there was a, was a moonlit night, and the clouds were coming in from the Pacific Ocean, and it started to drizzle. Oscar, after we had realized we'd better get off the mountain, he started to go over and look for a path, and he fell into one of these chasms, about 20 feet deep, wasn't too bad. But he crawled back up, and he was all scratched up from sagebrush, which was there. I tried to get off. I fell down. And after I fell down the second time, I said, Oscar, and by that time it was dark. I said, Oscar, I'm staying on the mountain. I'm not going off here. If one of us falls and breaks a leg or an arm, goes into shock, who knows what could happen. So I actually went down and got into the, uh, the unconsolidated ash and wiggled my way around and pulled some of the ash over me because it was cold by that time. You're at, you're at uh, 8,000 feet. And Oscar finally came back up. And just about that time, we looked across there and we saw a flash. And when we saw that flash, we jumped up and started screaming, Terry, Terry, where are you? What was Terry doing? Terry had two cameras. He was using the flash from his cameras to see himself along this very narrow <laughs> pathway. And here were these two dumb professional geographers sitting there with four flashes, not knowing what to do with them. Well, with Terry Vaughn and his flashes and our four flashes, we were able to get off the mountain safely. And the story, a child shall lead us. Okay, what, you're a suit? About the way? Oh, plate tectonics, yes. Uh, does that show up on the thing? Yes. As you know, at one time, uh, the earth is about 25% 20, land and 75% water. And up until about the middle of Mesozoic 
you know, archaeozoic, protozoic, paleozoic, mesozoic, cenozoic. About 200 million years ago, it was all one, one mass, and so then it started to split apart. One went north, paleo, uh, one went north, one went south, Pangaea and Gondwana. But about uh, shortly after that, at that time, North America and South America were connected by the isthmus. A part of the Pacific plate forced its way between the isthmus, broke the isthmus apart, and moved into the Caribbean and became the Caribbean plate. Then, shortly after that, about a, well, shortly after that, a few million years after that, the two, uh, North and South America, came back together again. And that's when a part of the Pacific plate came in and underrode the isthmus now, causing, and any time you had an underwriting of these plates, you would get volcanic activity or you would get earthquake activity. And that's why you have that whole string of beautiful earthquake or beautiful uh, volcanoes along that, that part, uh, western and southern part of Central America. And that's why Irasu is there, that's why Pacay is there, a whole raft of these beautiful volcanoes. Yes, here, how's our time? You have 10, uh, ten minutes after. So 10, okay, I'll finish. You have 10. Uh, should we skip that one, maybe? You have 15 minutes. 15, oh, 15 minutes. Let's, okay, let's skip minutes. that one. Let's go to, let's you want go to. to you want to do your so and then you have. Scam, Scam City. City. Let's go to Scam Eastport. City. Scam, Scam City. City. Havana, Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 20, 2002, 2003, 2004, we received permission to take students uh, to Cuba from the state U.S. Department of State. First of all, we had to clear McPherson. And that's when he said, I mean, McPherson said, yes, it might be good for our students to see their students and for their students to see our students. So we ended up taking 30 students to Havana, Cuba. <clears throat> we, had to, uh, we had to stay, in, we usually would stay in the homes of the uh, people in other countries, but you can't do that in Cuba. Uh, Cuban, a Cuban labor makes about $15 U.S. a month. A professor like myself would make 20 to 25 dollars a month. An M.D. 40 to 45 dollars a month. No disposable income. So, uh, what did we do? I told the kids we met downstairs in the hotel room before they took off to visit around the hotel. And I said, be careful. Be careful because these people don't have any money. If they get dollars, they can spend the dollars in dollar stores and buy hair dryers and anything they want. But they didn't have any money, so they're looking for money. Right away, I'd say about a half an hour after the kids took off, this one kid came back in. Prof, 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 look what I got. I got a, co a box of Cohiba, the best cigars in the world, for $40 US. <laughs> he only knows that they, we took McPherson back two uh, Cohiba cigars, which cost $25 a piece. A box was about $700. So they were scammed, but we didn't say anything. They were happy. Okay, fine. Uh, also, uh, uh, when we, also when we were there, the Castro permitted the, some of the local houses around in the city to open up their homes to uh, foreigners to get U.S. dollars and serve them Cuban meals. And you'd be walking down the street and somebody would hand you a card and telling you where to go and if you would like a, a perfect Cuban meal made by Cubans in the Cuban homes, fine. The kids would take them up on this. They would go to the home, get inside. Once inside, they found out that these supposedly meals were, the people were only making about $15 a month, were $10 for the meal. And that was a lot of money. And in many cases, the kids decided after that $10 that they weren't going to stay. But they were intimidated by the people there to stay and to kick up their $10. Now, when we were there also, Dorothy noticed that Swan Lake, Swan Lake Ballet was playing at the National Theater. Okay, let's go see Swan Lake Ballet. Beautiful National Theater in, in, uh, in Havana. Ten dollars for t tickets. That was a lot of money, but still that wasn't bad for Swan Lake Ballet, performed by professionals. So we go to the, uh, the time of the things going, the, 
the evening that the ballet was on, but there was a line, oh, it went back almost a block long. I said, gee, well, we're going to be here forever. Here came this gorgeous, beautiful, young Cuban woman. She said, you don't have to wait in that line. I'll sell you these two tickets for $10 each. And you can go right up to the front of the line and go right into the ballet. OK. Dorothy said, no, no, I'm, we're not going to do that. I says, come on, let's do it. And I gave her the $20. And she took us right up to the front of the line. We went right into the ballet, to the, uh, open, uh, to the theater. And we sat about three weeks, three uh, rows from the back of the theater. The first part went on fine. It was an intermission. During intermission, I started talking to people around me. And I found out that the last four or five rows of the theater were only five dollar seats. <laughs> she had really scammed us. She had really cleaned us up. Now, I believe the Peace Corps is next, isn't it? Okay. When, when John F. Kennedy set up the Peace Corps in the early 1960s, one of the first countries to take Peace Corps was Guatemala. And the, there are two-year assignments. And they came into Guatemala in the theater, 65, 63, 63, 64, and 65. So when 65 came there, we were there, and the first group of our Peace Corps kids were going home. And they, uh, the U.S. brought in a big, at that time, Pan Am was a big carrier in, the, in Central America, the big old 707 40 engine jets. And it was sitting out there to take these kids home. Well, that place was jammed. Everybody from the president, the, the, these Peace Corps kids have been extremely well received by the, by the Guatemalans. And in fact, the president of the, the president of the country was there, all the way down to these Indians and their Indian garb, quite a mixture. And every time I tell this story, I think I got a few more people. But there must have been a thousand people jammed into this small, uh, small airport with the 707 sitting up out front. I noticed when we walked into the airport that Guatemala had an air force of four jet trainers, which we had given them. And I, I, as an old air force person in World War II, I noticed that these things were, they were in the air just flying around someplace. I just noticed it casually. Fine. The kids get on the all the tears and emblazos and stuff. And the kids get on the 707. 707 lumbers out at the end of the runway. And I mean, love it. those things lumbered all over the place. And it starts down the runway, and it's lumbering. And finally, it got to about where we were standing when gear up and airborne, here came the four jets of the Baltimore Air Force. One took up a position on one ring, one ring, another took up a position on the other right wing. One got out in front, but high enough so it wouldn't, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just wouldn't mess up with the 707. And one stayed up and behind, and they, horse kick, or they escorted those young Americans all the way to the Mexican border. And I thought, what a fitting farewell to a group of kids who had been well received, who had given two years of their lives to the Guatemalan people. Okay, now we can. We have to, how much time do we have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Are there any questions? There, you know, we we had to be selective. You saw what the you have the list of all the different chapters. About twenty-seven, I think. They're vignettes. They're short chapters. We had I had to select half a dozen or so uh, because of the time constraints. Now, any questions? Just speak up if you have any. If not, I'll tell another story. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Yeah, do you still have contacts? Do I what? Do you still have contacts in Guatemala? Oh, yes. Go back? Oh, yeah, we've been there ever since. In fact, that's my second home. Yeah. Yeah, we were there. Well, yeah, we, are you, fact, do you feel safe, safer now or less no, safe? No, no, it's not good now, yeah. to be quite honest. I've had some <laughs> bad experiences. No, we never had any bad experiences. Uh, I, I've worked with this Bud Minkle. Bud Minkle's about six feet two, and he's broader than I am, and we've been all over Latin America together for all these many years, and knock on, we've never had any problem 
problem with anybody. But Guatemala City right now, or the Guatemala, is, I, I wouldn't recommend it unless you went with a group, to put it that way, uh, as of right now, okay? Any more questions? Want me to tell you one more story? Okay, let me tell you about what's called political instability. Uh, we had a, uh, Bud and I had a uh, uh, training session in uh, La Paz, Bolivia in 1980. And <clears throat> when we went into a country like this, we, oh, we were operating through the Organization of American States. Within the Organization of American States, there's a geography commission. And Bud and I were officers in this geography commission for two four-year periods, so all, all, as long as you can be there. So we were going into La Paz, into uh, Bolivia, La Paz, and set up one of these teaching training institutes where their, their geographers weren't as nearly advanced in techniques using the satellites, statistical techniques, and we would go in and set up training sessions for them. But what we usually did, we would always go to the embassy and check in. And if the ambassador were available, we would meet with the ambassador if he had time for us. So we go to La Paz, we're sitting in La Paz, we're in La Paz, we make the appointment to go to the embassy, and the ambassador was there. And he took us into his office. I'll never forget, this was during the Carter administration. He was a young fellow, not more than 35 years old or 40 at the most. And he was sitting in this beautiful, behind this beautiful desk, very informal. He had his feet up on the desk and began quizzing us. And he was really interested in what we were doing there. And he was very pleased that we were trying to help the Bolivian people with their, uh, with their training of their geographers. And one of the things we always ask them, we said, how, one of the th last things we ask them, how are things politically? How, how, what's the stability? Do you think we're going to have any problems when we're here during our eight weeks period? Because Bolivia was one of the countries in Latin America which has had more, more presidents than has had years of existence. Just one coup after another. He says, things are quiet. We got that our feelers out. We're not going to have any problems at all. Things have been quiet. They're going to remain quiet. So don't even worry about it. Next morning, I get up to go to breakfast. And our hotel in Panador, about whatever floor it was, top floor, overlooked the National Stadium, where they played their football games, their soccer games. Beautiful stadium. I look out of the window of the restaurant, and what was out there? Not soccer players, weapons carriers, machine gun nests up in the up in the um, up in the stadium. Uh, all different kind of uh, of armed uh, of armed uh, peril. What had happened overnight? A coup. They overthrew the government. And that talks about the political stability of the, the, the idea of the political stability of the ambassador to uh, Bolivia. Okay, is that it? Good enough? Any other questions? Oh, yeah, the book. I want to show you that he brought a copy of his book. So if anybody's interested in reading it, I was the happy recipient. He gave a copy to John and to me last year, and we read it, and it is very interesting and very fascinating. And you have some wonderful memories, and I appreciate you sharing them That's with quite us. All right. Thank you so much. I will say the uh, the book, there's no profit there. The profit, if, if, if there's a, there are some sales. They go into a, a, a development thing we set up, Dorothy and I set up in the Department of Geography. The money goes into that department, and it's used to uh, finance our graduate students when they go to professional meetings to present their research. Okay. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.